Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. I want to just thank you so much for enjoying this day. Bishop's coming behind me. And so I'm not sure what he's going to say. But I hope he has a wonderful gift in his pocket that might be glittering or might have a something I need to put in the safe or something like that or even possibly green green is good green is good new green is even better the higher the zeros the higher the zeros right come on girls I know you're flowing with me Okay. What do you Praise got? the Lord. You have anything in your pocket? I have. Uh, I did buy you something. Oh, you did? I told you this morning. I know. I was just teasing. It's wonderful. <laughs> I'll have to work three or four extra weeks to pay for it. Well. No, I want to say <laughs> three or four extra months to pay for it. Sit down. Stay with me out here. Oh, Help me no, preach. You don't need Oh, yeah, help me preach. Oh, glory. <laughs> Who knows what I might say on a day like this. She didn't, she didn't know I was going to do this, so this ought to be really fun. I don't like this chair. <laughs> you okay? I don't know. <laughs> you good? Okay. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I do want to say to you, you're an incredible mom. Oh. You're an incredible grandmother. Thank you. You're a great mom for this house. And I want to say to all the ladies that are here today, we celebrate all of our ladies. We celebrate all of our ladies because we recognize that there are people in the room that wanted to be a mother. Maybe that's not happened yet. We realize there are people that may have lost their mother, and this is a difficult day. But we want to celebrate what Pastor Kathy just said a while ago, that you're a daughter of the king. You're valued. You're priceless. You're amazing. There's nobody like you in all the world. And uh, I, I tweeted this out this week. I said... For all of you men that constantly criticize your wife's judgment, just remember she chose you. I retweeted that. So, uh, so we believe that every woman in the room it twice. I, ought to, I ought to have some help from men today in the room. How many of you are grateful for how wise your wife is? Come on, just give the Lord a great big hand. Come on, men, help me give the ladies on, a great God, big hand, would you? Join me in celebrating all the women of this house today. We bless you. We honor you. We celebrate you, ladies. You're amazing. Everybody just stand with me. Will you real quickly just stand? I want to read one verse of Scripture out of Proverbs chapter 31. I'm going to read it from the Message Bibles. They'll put it on the screens. And then Kathy and I are going to talk a little bit. Today's Mother's Day, and I'm not a mother. So how many of you know sometimes, if we're honest, it's difficult for us to, as men, to understand particularly the heart of a mother and the, sometimes the absolute lengths to which mothers go to take care of their children. The sacrifice, the anguish, the love of a mom to give to her children at her own expense often. Lots of times moms make sure kids have clothes when they don't get clothes that they want. They have the things they need when they don't get to do the things they wanted to do. I'll never know the pain of childbirth. Thank you, Jesus. I remember, though, I do remember being present when a, 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 one of our children was done by Caesarean uh, and so... Uh, Holly was born that way, so I wasn't able to go at that time. In those days, they didn't let you go in for Caesarean births. But um, I got to go in for the other. I remember being a tremendous help and support system to Kathy. It was quite painful for me because I was rubbing her back and trying to help her. My, my, <laughs> my most precious memory of Lindsay being born was her telling me, if you don't put that Sports Illustrated magazine down and get over here and help me breathe. So I didn't know when to blow and when to suck, and I was like all confused, and I was 
blowing and sucking. I almost passed out, and she said, oh, sit down. <laughs> sit down. You're kind of out of your mind. <laughs> but here's what Proverbs says. The Bible talks about a woman that is virtuous, a woman that is godly, a woman that is to be honored. It says in verse number 27, it says, She keeps her eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. Kathy's lived that verse out very well. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you've outclassed them all. Charm may mislead and beauty will soon fade. But the woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. Here's what I say to all of us that are today blessed to have mothers and wives who are the mothers of our children. Give her everything she deserves. Festoon her with li her life with praise today. That means celebrate her in every way possible. So today, I'm going to speak a blessing over our moms. I'm going to share real quickly just a couple of simple things that I believe are important for us to remember. And I trust that this will be a great Mother's Day in all of your lives. Father, I pray today for mothers and ladies all across this room. We celebrate them. Lord, not just natural moms, but spiritual moms, church mothers who have put their life on the line to see people come to know Christ, live for you, who've looked well to the ways of their household, Lord, today you said that a woman who fears the Lord is even greater than beauty and charm. She's to be admired and given honor. And Lord, today we celebrate our ladies for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you. I want to talk for just a minute. Kathy and I are going to talk. I'm going to talk about four things that I believe are the greatest gifts. We talk about finding Mother's Day gifts for mothers. I want to talk to the ladies for a minute. I want to talk about the greatest gifts you can give your children, the greatest gifts a mom can give her children. Four things. If you're taking notes, I'm going to go through them really quickly, but you can write them down. First of all, the first thing that a mother gives to her children as a gift is a, a protected environment for them to grow in, a protected environment for them to grow in. You realize that from the very inception or conception of a child, it's the mother that gives that child a protective space to grow in. It's called the womb. And when you, when you know that once moms find out they're pregnant, they quit eating certain things, they quit doing certain things, they don't, they don't do the worm on the dance floor because they recognize that they are carrying something that is precious. They're carrying life. The Bible says that we've been entrusted. Ladies, you've been entrusted with the gift of life. You've had the privilege of being the givers who've been entrusted, the receivers who've been entrusted with the gift of life. The word entrusted means to be given a responsibility or to have something that was entrusted to you for care and for protection. Every parent recognizes that when your children are given to you, they're only given to you for a season. You have certain seasons of their life. You'll always be their mother, but it won't always be the same season. I learned a long time ago that when my kids were little, you direct them or you lead them by command. Go, go make your bed. Go brush your teeth. Get a bath. You do things by command. When they become teenagers and adolescents, and particularly when they start going out with their friends, you don't lead them by command. You lead them by counsel. You say, here's some things you need to take and remember. You need to take advice. Listen to what I'm telling you. When my girls would leave my house, every time they'd leave my house with their friends, if I was home, I'd say the same thing to them. Make sure you live up to your name. Because you say that you're a follower of Christ, this household honors the Lord, make sure that whatever you do tonight, you live up to the name that you carry. And thirdly, when they get older and become parents of their own, in their own right, you lead them by concern. You pray for them. You hold them up to Jesus. 
But one of the things, moms, I just want to say, I want to challenge. I, if I had an hour to talk about this and Kathy and I could really unfold, the big tragedy in our nation today is we have, we have sex trade, we have all kinds of molestation, we have family lives that are torn apart, and the Bible's not ignorant of any of that. The Bible's full of all kinds of stories where all of that went on. But one of the things I believe today, moms, the greatest gift you can give to your children is to give them a protected environment to grow up in. That means you never allow them to be put in a place of vulnerability that you're not guarding them because you've been entrusted to watch over their life while they're under your care. I wonder how many today, how many lives would have been different had they been able to have a parent who protected them in the environment they were in when they were 10, 12, 13 years old. Sometimes it's easier in the natural it looks like to turn away and not say anything. I want to say to everybody today, I believe that the greatest gift as a mom that you can give your kids is a protected environment. Let me tell you something. There's a lady in the Bible. Her name is Zipporah. Zipporah. Most people don't really know a whole lot about Zipporah. Zipporah is Moses' wife. Moses' wife was a lady that was from Midian. She was a Midianite. That meant she was a woman of dark skin. She had come from some part of northern Africa. When he took her as a wife, his family didn't like her. Miriam and Aaron both had an attitude about her. But she became the mother of his children. And she was not raised in an environment of knowing the God of Israel. She was married into that. But she by marriage accepted the invitation to be his wife, so therefore took on the customs of his worship. But watch this. Moses, even though he was a great leader, even though he was a great deliverer, he wasn't a great father. There's some things that Moses... Samuel, David, they all share in common, and that is they are great men of faith. They just weren't men who were great fathers. But thank God for Zipporah, because actually the, the angel of the Lord came to destroy Moses' family. God was going to take him out, and the reason he was going to take him out was because he had not circumcised his kids, his sons. He had not followed in the actual steps of worship with his children, even though he himself was just going for it for God. But he wasn't bringing it home. And when the angel showed up, Zipporah took her sons and circumcised them and protected her house from the vulnerability of what their dad wouldn't do. Listen to me, ladies. If you are with a father who won't live up to his responsibility, don't leave your house vulnerable. Do what is necessary. There are days when this lady right here, because of my schedule, my, my life, and particularly when our kids were smaller, there are days that I didn't get things done that need to be got done. I had to repent before God for it because I let my work in ministry keep me from my actual work in my house. And I never forget the days when Kathy would come to me and she'd say, if you're not going to do this, I am going to take care of this because our children will be raised and know the ways of the Lord. And there are some things that have to be brought home in order to protect them for their destiny, their future, and the purpose of God on their life. Am I helping anybody in the room today? Don't believe that you're overstepping your husband if you salvage your children when death is knocking on the door because of something he wouldn't do. That's not superseding his headship. That's stepping into a responsibility that says as a mom, I am going to protect the environment of my household. Can I interrupt there? Mm -hmm. um, I'm stuck. Is uh, not only not protecting and from that viewpoint, but it could be sometimes that women sometimes just discern yes. something more at the time. 
And so it might not be that your husband's not doing it like this, but you're not, but you discern something greater than before, you know, than, than maybe you. There's been lots of times with our girls, and I'll say, I just discern this. I discern that this boy or this is not a good situation for them. I don't think we should send them here. And you'll say, well, why do you feel that way? And then we make that decision together. But there's a lot of times I, I have, uh, I know we got to hurry, but there's a story that um, with Lindsay that when we lived in a small town, I was on the platform. At, I led worship for 20 years. I was on the platform leading worship, and I got off the platform. We were in the middle of a conference, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to go home because Lindsay had not come to church yet. And she was supposed to be there. She had had a volleyball game, and I got to the house, and there was a, a car in the driveway, and I knew things were not good. So me and my wonderful discernment went into mother mode like real quick, you know, how that'll happen. And so the car took off, and I just knew that she was in that car, right? And so I was in a car with a, a police officer, and so I said, follow him. So you have to understand now there's a conference going on. My husband's preaching. All of our friends from around the world, and I'm chasing a car I do not know that I do have my daughters in with a police officer all over a little town because I knew that this was not right. So in the meantime, we call another police, and now I have a police behind me and a police officer chasing this car all over town. So, I mean, this is a lot funnier than it seems, but, you know, at the time, it was like crazy. And so, finally, um, through a lot of going all over the town, um, we ended up right back at our house, and there was no car. So, I went in with the police officer who was in our church, and Lindsay was in there, and she goes, oh, I've been here. <laughs> I'm like, uh, you don't know what, you don't even want to know what I said. And I said, get yourself dressed. We're going to church. So she got herself dressed. We put her in the car. And she gave me permission to tell this story. So anyway, I'm okay. And so put her in the car. And we got to church. And so we drove up the, by the ready room. And she jumped out of the car and ran from me. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> so how many know you went from discerning from hearing God, discerning, chasing, to running all over the creation. And then she ran for me, and you know what that meant? Wonder Woman came out. Wonder Woman. I mean, I ran, and the whole time it was not good, you know, when you have bladder issues. <laughs> Now, there ain't no women in here like that, but that's all right. I'll be honest. I was running and running. Now all my friends are inside preaching up a storm. All of our friends from all over the country, like we do AD, and I'm, we're chasing my child. But let me tell you something. When I caught her, and Wonder Woman caught her, I put my arm around her arm and I led her back to the church and I said, let me just tell you something, chick. You are called by God. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. And God's called you for a specific purpose and you're gonna accomplish that girl. And right now you're getting ready to go in that church and sit on the front row. Right. <laughs> and how many understand something? You need to, and I'm saying all this to say this, Tony D Bishop doesn't even know what was going on. He was caught in the glory. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So what I'm saying to you ladies, not just as a mom, but as a friend, as a spiritual mom, don't get so caught up that you don't hear Jesus. Whisper in your ear the things that you need to know and the discernment that you need to know. And then don't be afraid to take action on it because the very thing, she was my treasure. 
she, I was speaking into her future, and now look where she is. Look what God has done. Was it because of me? No, it's because of the Father. But the, I knew at that time that it was something that God was doing in her life. And if you speak those words over your children. You speak those words over your friends. You speak those words over your grandchildren because they will be what God's called them to be. But you must begin to hear yes. God, discern what he's saying, and do what God's called you to do, right? Hallelujah. That's, well, that's great. A little side note. Really good. That's why I ask you to stay. Well, you know, sometimes things just come out. At least, <laughs> like when you run? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> at least I found out I had a bladder issue, yeah. you know. And I had something to change into. Yeah. But you were so caught in the glory, you didn't know, know what was yeah, going on. Yeah. That brings me to my second point. The second thing. <laughs> what is it down here? Let me see if I can help. Yeah. The, second thing, <laughs> the second thing that's the greatest gift you can give them is a passionate faith to live for. A passionate faith to live for. When Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he makes mention to Timothy of this. He said, I'm reminded of the faith that was in your mother, Lois, and your grandmother, um, your mother, uh, Eunice, and your grandmother, Lois. And he said, here's what he said, and you're following in the footsteps of their example. You're following in the footsteps of their example. Ladies, please listen to me. And this is true for all of us men as well. Our children don't always follow our directions, but they do follow our example. They don't always do what I say, but they do do what I do. So when you live out a vibrant faith, you give them a faith to live in. In other words, listen, all of, everybody in this room, at some point in time, you may have raised the perfect child. We all think we did in some ways. But the truth of the matter is everybody deals with people that need to know that their life is theirs, that it belongs to Christ because nobody's born a Christian. We'll try that one more time. Nobody's born a Christian. You may be born into a Christian home, but nobody's born a Christian. So that means that parents, oftentimes fathers, mothers, are the first evangelists to ever share their faith with their kids. That's why we don't need to have homes that are filled with negative attitudes about the difficult seasons in our life. Because if we keep singing about how much we trust him, but come home and don't live that out, we give them an example to follow that means they can be overwhelmed, fall apart, and their life can be disoriented. Don't, don't, please don't give your children, ladies, don't give your children the suspicion you have of everybody just because you got hurt somewhere. If you're a single mom, please don't make them believe that every man's going to be a bad, a bad issue in their life. Give them your faith. Give them what God did in your life that was so positive that your life will never be the same. Yes, they may carry your looks, but that'll fade. Yes, they may have your personality, but that, the Bible says, can be deceiving. What is not going to deceive them and what will not fade away is your faith. Give them your faith. Thirdly, and I want you to speak to this because I, it's in my notes here. You'll find your name here. All right, well, yeah. what am I supposed to say? Well, I, third thing you can give them is the gift of a praying mother who will fight for their future. A praying mother who will fight for their future. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah was barren, couldn't have a child. The Bible says she literally fought, she contended to have a child. She made a promise to God, if you give me that child, I'll give him back to you. God gave her a child, his name was Samuel. And she kept her word, she gave him back to God. But here's the key. The Bible says that every year Hannah came to visit Samuel and every year she came to visit him while he was under the tutelage of Eli the high priest. Every year she came to visit him, she brought him, the Bible says, a new tunic. That literally meant she made him new garments or new coverings to live his life in. So every year she made sure she covered him for the season he was in. She was a praying mama just not for his birth. She was a praying mama for his entire life. She was there to fight for his future 
even when he wasn't living in her house. And Samuel became the prophet of the Old Testament that the Bible says this, that when he would prophesy, not a single word that he prophesied fell to the ground and died. Why? He had a praying mama who prayed for him his entire life. Kathy's got such, my wife, for those of you that know her, you know this is true. Kathy is, there's not anything that really fake about Kathy. If you know her, she's real. She's sometimes raw. She's authentic. She's genuine. And particularly in her love for God, because God so transformed her life uh, when just before college. But she is a warrior when it comes to praying. She is a warrior when it comes to praying. And I remember the battles when she would fight for our girls. I could hear her in the middle of the night. Some days I'd walk in the house and she'd be praying. And I would hear her fighting, standing between hell and our children and saying, you will not have my daughter. You will not have my child's future. And even when, listen to me, even when children can't fight for themselves or don't even know how to, Ted Hugh makes a statement that I've never forgotten. He said, when I was a teenager about to walk away from God, he said, my mother went into intercession for my life. And here's what she said. She said to God, she said, whatever price hell tries to pay to get him, I will pay a higher price to see that the destiny of his life is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Whatever price has to be paid, I will see to it that my children walk out and live out their faith. You know, I think the reason why I'm probably like I am because I had a praying mom. And um, my mom, when I was, ra I was raised in church and then I fell away from God after I left high school and got myself into a really bad pickle. But I knew that her, she would tell me her and her friends were praying for me. I moved out of state when I was like 18 years old, was living in an apartment, apartment. I didn't have a car. I washed my clothes in a bathtub, walked to work. And the only peace that I really had during that time was walking into a Christian bookstore and hearing the music playing when God was dealing with my heart because I had left him and forsaken him in my life. But I knew during that nine tenth month period that my mom was praying for me into the intercession so that I could become what God wanted me to become. It was a very difficult time for my life, but all of a sudden, you know, in three days, God turned it around for me. I gave my heart back to the Lord. I was by myself in an apartment. I had a Bible that was way up high and full of dust and I'll never forget when I pulled that Bible off the shelf in a closet and I wiped the dust off of it and opened it once again and it became life to me I called my mom and in three days I was home and there was great celebration there's a lot more to my story and to the testimony that God brought me through even more so after that but when I had, you know, God pulled me up from the miry clay, put my feet upon a rock and put a new song in my mouth. And ever since that day, I knew that when I had children and whatever they walked through, because you know, when they're small, you're praying for them that their destiny would be fulfilled. When they get to be teenagers and they start acting like crazy people, you're like, Lord, I don't care if they do have a destiny. I just want to kill them, you know? And so your, your, your prayer life has to begin to change. You have to become more intentional with the things that you pray over your children. You have to become wiser. You have to become, you know, before you're always thinking when they're little, like, are they, if you don't hear them, you know they're in the kitchen doing something they shouldn't be doing, right? When you hear silence, when they're small, when you get, when they get older, you have to have even more discernment of what's going on. And so God taught me from my own praying mom how to be a praying mom. Mm. And I have literally taken what she taught me and knowing what I came through. See, I never forget. I'll never forget. Every time I sit on that front row and I lift my hands to the Father, I never forget the miry clay that he brought me out of. I'll never forget where I was when he 
pulled me up and put my feet upon a rock and he put a new song in my mouth. Even when I don't feel like praising him, even when everything's gone wrong that morning, I can still put my hands up and praise the King of Kings because he's the one who pulled me up out of that miry clay. He's the one who put a new song in my mouth. And how can I not help but praise him? And so you as a parent, if you're a spiritual mom, if you're a natural mom, if you're just a friend of friends, wherever you are, God is faithful and he's calling you to a higher place of prayer. You pray the word. You say, well, I don't know the word. Then learn the word. Pray the word. Pray the word. Pray the word. The word doesn't come back void. If he said it, he will do it. He will do what he says he will do. You can be yes. what God says you can be. Your children will be in the household of faith you must declare it over your children yes. I was just talking to somebody recently and they were going through some things with their kids and I said get the oil get the word get the oil get the word there's you don't know how many times I've taken the oil and put it on my kids over their bedroom and on their pillows in their car they had no idea I had a secret stash of oil all the time they had no idea they were breathing oil they were sucking oil they probably were licking oil It didn't matter. I took the oil and I took the word of God and I believed in faith that God was going to do something miraculous. And those are the things you have to do. Those yes. are the keys yes. that you have to do. You have to believe the word. Then you put the word on them and know by faith he's going to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today God has called you to come higher. He's called you to take this thing higher. He's called you to be a prayer warrior. He's called you to have discernment. He's called you to for such a time as this. And so I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Jonathan. Mother's Day. I think Jonathan's just going to play for me. Listen, you cannot leave the future of your children up to an hour and a half on Sunday morning. You have to believe that God's given you the grace to stand in the gap and fight for their life. And the last thing, the greatest gift you can give your kids is the wisdom of making a priority out of God's house, out of church life. I learned to love God's house not because I had a natural love for it, but because my parents taught me to love God's house. They taught me what it meant to be involved in church life. The value of the community of faith. Because how many of you recognize this is not just a place you go to get a word? It's not just a place you go to get an encounter. It really is a place you go to receive strength, connection. It's a way of life for people who understand how the kingdom operates. I, I, there's an old African proverb that says it takes a village, and rightfully so. My life is impacted today by church mothers as much as it was by my own mother. I had church mothers. My, there was a church mother in our church growing up that when I... I was in trouble with my dad. She'd pray me through. When I was 18, she looked at my father and said, I never thought he'd live to graduate. But she called the purpose of God out of my life. She believed for me. There are people, there's women all over this church room today who there ought to be young people in this church that you know personally. You're calling the destiny out of them. If you're an ongoing part of the life of the Gate Church, it's not just about your kids. It's about our kids. Sometimes another voice speaks to them even more powerfully than their own parents' voice. We can't put our personal needs in front of teaching our children about the value of God's house. I know we're busy. I know we got budding careers and building careers and we're tired and there's long days but I got 41 years of doing this and one of the things I can say is I've watched families who did not make being involved in the local church a priority and their kids wandered away from their faith 
and they wondered why. Just because they're in church doesn't mean they're going to walk with Jesus. But I can guarantee you having them in church and teaching them the value of being in church gives you a lot better opportunity for them to follow Christ than it is for you not to give them a love for the house of God. You know what? I wanted my kids to grow up with their peer group not being just a group of athletes or a group of popular people at their school. I wanted my kids growing up with their peer group to be kids that worship together, went to church together. I wanted, I, w- I was glad that when my children found a mate, Jason is here today. When Jason started dating Amanda, the one thing she said to him, she said, you're going to have to come to church with me. Jason had never been to a church, ever, all right? Never been to a church. In fact, when he got invited to a, we had a living Lord's Supper, and as an illustrated sermon, he kept asking Amanda, when are we going to eat? <laughs> he thought it's a supper, when we went to supper. He knew nothing about church. But he knew if I'm gonna, if we're gonna date, if we're gonna go out, faith is so real in this family that I'm gonna have to be a part of it. I wanted my kids to find their mates in the house of God. I didn't want them to find them in a bar or somewhere at work or on a, on a chat line. I wanted them to find them among people that worshiped, magnified God. Well, how does that happen? It happens when you teach them to have an incredible love for the house of God. And when you're strengthened by that, I believe that some of these are the greatest gifts you can give your kids. A protected environment, a passionate faith, a praying mama, and a priority of God's life in the house of God. Stand with me, would you? Kathy and I are going to join hands today and we're going to pray over moms everywhere. There are no perfect parents. There are no perfect children. All of us in this room it can mark times in our life when, when things didn't go right. And we didn't do it right. But here's what's amazing to me is that even when I don't get it right, when my heart is pointed towards him, he still has a way of making it right. And you need to know today, moms, that God's with you. Your children may have left your house, but they've not left the reach of your prayers. They've not left the realm of your influence. And they've not left the protectiveness that you have over their life. So, Father, today we lift our voice and we pray for mothers all over this room. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will touch them with a special grace, a fresh grace. I pray that there will be an awareness that you're with them and that the gift of life that you entrusted to them, they are well able to carry, to bring forth, to build, to help lead into a life that represents Christ. Lord, I pray for every mother in this room today who feels like a failure. I pray in Jesus' name that that spirit of condemnation will get off of them. I pray that the grace of God will shine on them. They'll hold their head up today. Because a woman who fears the Lord, she's to be honored. She's to be celebrated. Lord, today we celebrate God-fearing women at the Gate Church. And we bless you in the name of the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift his countenance upon you.